Hey, soccer fans, welcome back to the Feed the Fire podcast. I'm your host, Nick, and oh man, there is so much going on in the world of Chicago Fire Soccer and Major League Soccer. We've got the return to red. We've got roster compliance moves and official announcements. The drama between the U.S. Open Cup and Major League Soccer continues, and now we've got the added drama, because if your life isn't drama-filled enough, we're going to throw in a referee lockout just to round things out. So stay tuned for our takes on all of this and more in tonight's episode. Hey, soccer fans, welcome back again to the Feed the Fire podcast. I'm your host, Nick. I have so much to share with you. I was so excited and overjoyed to have attended the Chicago Fire's Return to Red jersey launch party last Thursday, February 15th. I just couldn't wait to share all my experiences with you on the show. If you haven't already seen all the pictures and videos that I have put out on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook and a little bit on YouTube too, like go check it all out. Like I'm not even doing any sort of soft intro here because I'm just so pumped to explain it all to you. And we have so much to discuss going on with the Chicago Fire and Major League Soccer. So again, we're going to get right into it and recap the event at Moonlight Studios in Chicago from February 15th, just this past Thursday. First off, got to give a big thank you to the Chicago Fire organization for an amazing event. Special thanks to Rudy Hodgson, the commentator that you get to hear on Apple TV, as well as the communications coordinator for the Chicago Fire. He and his entire team quite literally rolled out the red carpet for us and then sent us home after a great night with a wonderful gift box full of swag, including the new Return to Red jersey. I am thrilled and I and my wife got to attend with me and I'm very excited that my very very Greek wife has now added some color to her otherwise black and gray wardrobe. It's an ethnic joke, you know if you know you know. Anyway, there was palpable energy in the room that night. The lights were dimmed and tinted red, the food and drinks were plentiful. There was an impressive list of attendees. Brian McBride, Dama Kovalenko, Harry Ship were all there. I saw some of the board members from the Black Fire supporter group, the Red Line supporter group, and I'm sure a bunch of other supporters and season ticket holder groups were there as well. I got to meet and it was a it was very great talking with Alex Campbell of CHGO Fire, Joe Chats of Ontap Sportsnet, Tim Hotza, sorry if I'm butchering your name there Tim, something I do here, uh, of the Men in Red media. I, I mean the media was there, the people who covered the team was there, the players were there, the fans, the supporters. It was an incredible experience and then you have president of operations dave baldwin kicking things off with the state of the union style speech but he really emphasized that the chicago fire are really trying to build a winning culture within the organization with the executives and managers that they're hiring with the projects that they're allowing their employees to go out and do like you saw it in a recent promotional thing there are chicago fire billboards and signs all over the city and if you're tweeting uh at the chicago fire with their hashtag with those pictures of you and those billboards they might give you jerseys and tickets right they they're really trying to do their best to reconnect with the old fans expand to new fans and i think they're doing a pretty darn good job of it if i may say so myself i've been following this team since 98 in in one level or other and this is the most i've ever felt connected with this team and it helps having the podcast it helps kind of having some some slight connections some social connections here and there but i can see that they're really really making the effort and i think it's paying off they didn't pay me to say that we just had a lot of fun at the event drinks were shared words were exchanged here we go uh but after dave baldwin's speech which was excellent kind of outlining the vision and plan and, and he's a phenomenal speaker and what's crazy is i think he was the tallest person in the room too so he had this air about him like people just saw him walking around and you're like that guy's important that guy's really important then he gets on the stage and introduces himself and there you go um I also have his speech recorded on Twitter, so go find me at Glasshouse Soccer, spelled S O C C R due to character limits. Uh, but you can go back and find that from February 15th and watch the speech that I filmed when I was there live. And after he wrapped up, the, the legend himself, uh, how else do you introduce this man? Demarcus Beasley comes out, takes the mic, 
hypes the crowd up more, explains what the fire really meant to him as a player, as his first club coming up, you know, as, as a youth player and then playing for the fire. And what was phenomenal from DeMarcus Beasley was how much he interacted with the crowd afterwards. He went out, talked to fans, uh, took pictures with people. He even had some good laughs. There was a, a Chicago Fire fan there who went to take a picture with him. And as Beasley was posing, the fan pulled out a Celtic scarf <laughs> And as you all know, Beasley played for Rangers, their mortal enemies, so everyone had a good laugh about that. Beasley was a good sport about it. It was a lot of fun. And that had to be my personal highlight of the night. This guy was one of my idols growing up. When I was playing on the left wing as a midfielder in my youth days, watching him at... Uh, it was kind of cool. I told him when I got to take a picture of him, I remember watching you play at North Central College when the Chicago Fire played there when Soldier Field was under renovations. And he's like, looking at me like, you remember all the way back that way? I guess maybe I do look a little younger than than my almost 40-year-old self here. Uh, but if anyone looks young, it's DeMarcus Beasley. I mean, that guy is, is what, 42, I think, right now? He looks like he could lace up his boots and put in another solid 15, 20 minutes for a team that's out there. The man looks good, I'll tell you that. So that was probably one of my personal highlights, if not my the personal highlight for me that night. But again, Dave Baldwin gives his kind of Chicago State of the Union. DeMarcus Beasley hypes the crowd up, shares his memories and what the club means to him and, and what the city means to him. And then they drop the, the jersey video. Apologies when I got shoved in the back as everyone crowded forward and my camera rotated right as the kit was coming out. Oh, sorry guys, I hope I didn't let you down with that one. My first big live event and that happens, but man... The, the video was fantastic. You could see the players in the video weren't just mailing it in like it was some acting job for them. They were having a lot of fun representing the Return to Red kit, and it showed on camera. Also, just another little side note, Sparky, the fire mascot, the big Dalmatian, he had a full red suit on, double-breasted red suit. And then, of course, when the jersey finally gets revealed, he sheds the formal wear and is back in his red kit, and it was fantastic to see. I cannot wait to see what this club rolls out, including all new match day experiences. You've seen some of the polls out there about what songs you want to hear, and DJ Step was at the event as well, just getting the crowd hyped and keeping it hyped throughout the night. The, the One of the things Dave Baldwin said is there's a lot of new match day experiences, and to be perfectly honest, that is something that I noticed lacking when I took my family and some friends and, and our kids to games over the last couple of years, there wasn't really much for the kids to do. They had the little kids corner, but what? It was coloring posters and some inflatable soccer stuff, right? I, I think, and I hope the way Dave Baldwin made it sound is that they're going to expand a lot of the stuff in the stadium, as well as he kept saying, be in your seats early because they're probably gonna be doing a lot of stuff on the pitch beforehand too maybe some i don't know maybe some crazy light up stuff maybe some stuff with the lighting in the stadium uh maybe more fireworks you can never have too many fireworks but you know i used to work at a fireworks store for you know six or seven years growing up in indiana so i do love my fireworks and if anyone needs a good fireworks guy let me know i'll, I'll put you in touch but that is some of the the highlights of the night I was fortunate to attend with my wife and my goddaughter in from out of town. Uh, she's actually in from Minneapolis, and she's like, yeah, I know we have a soccer team here, but I didn't know soccer teams could do anything like this. This is amazing. So Chicago Fire, we've got another fan in Minneapolis who went home with the new Return to Red kit. So uh, it's it's a it was a phenomenal night. Kudos to everyone who was there. Great event. It just can't say thank you enough to the Chicago Fire for including me. And hopefully you, as everyone out there consuming it all on social media, enjoyed it. And if you liked that, let me know. If those, if you liked my pictures, if you liked the video, if you like some of the stories you're getting here from myself and from other Fire media outlets, let me know. We can pass that on to the Chicago Fire. There were a couple people who I met that night who really want to know what the fans are thinking and how they can improve we will pass that on i will push that up the chain and we can really let them know your opinions obviously joe mansueto hears the opinions of everyone and is willing to make changes changing the logo bringing back the red changing up some things in house as well so you see all of that here on display at the return to red event and the kit itself 
just sharp. The only way to describe it, and the way I've heard many people describe it, is this is a Chicago Fire kit. Also, real quick, want to plug a friend of mine. Go check out the uh, Across the Galaxy podcast, uh, News Across the Galaxy, NAGS. Go check those guys out. They are doing a full kit ranking as well as keeping you up to date on everything going on with the Galaxy and the Western Conference. Um, they, they reached out to me for a quote, so you'll hear some of my words in their review as well. And also, since we're plugging some friends, the Designated Players Pod have updated and reviewed all of the Chicago or the MLS teams. They've got all their preseason previews out there. I was fortunate enough to join them talking Chicago Fire a little bit. Uh, talked a lot more Tom Barlow than probably we all expected, but it was a great conversation. So again, go find News Across the Galaxy. Go find Designated Player Pod. Be on the lookout for some content from Feed the Fire. All right, let's move on to the next big thing to come out of the Chicago Fire organization this week. A lot of the player moves. They kept the good times going. There were a few people who thought maybe Hugo Kuypers would show up or Kellen Acosta would show up at the Return to Red event. But no, Kellen was out training. Hugo hadn't made it into the country yet. But they did get announced as officially signed. Uh, you can go back to the last couple episodes here on the Feed the Fire podcast if you want to know my takes on all of that. Real quick to recap, these are two players who do move the needle closer to making the playoffs competing in the playoffs and competing for trophies. The defensive moves that we saw, Aragoni, Salquest, Gutman, Gasper, those players are all improvements as to what the Chicago Fire had, but nothing you could really say, yes, we are going to make the playoffs now. Yes, we're going to be competitive with the top teams in the Eastern Conference. When you add Acosta and, and Kuypers, you can say those things. We are going to be competitive in every match, and we should make the playoffs not even the playing game. We should just make the playoffs solid, be in, in one of those top eight, top seven teams. And in fact, I have the fire finishing seventh, but more on some preseason rankings later. So we have those official announcements. Kellen Acosta, who's going to really link the midfield, who's going to be moving the ball around a lot more, linking up a lot of players together, and someone who, who Brian Gutierrez should pair nicely with, I think. Additionally, Hugo Kuypers is a guy who's going to get on the end of a lot of opportunities to finish. I think Mueller and Gutierrez and Shakiri and Acosta and everyone's just going to be looking for him. First chance, second chance, third chance, right? They're going to be like quarterbacks going through their progressions and Hugo Kuypers is going to be their first read and then they're going to play the ball laterally. Acosta is going to keep some of that possession and then Hugo Kuypers will be the second read and the third read until they can get the ball to him and he can convert it on net. Now, he's not without some of his flaws. He does rely on service, and a lot of the time, if you look at that breakout golden boot gold scoring season he had for Ghent in Belgium in 2022-2023, there were a handful of penalty kick goals in there and a handful of ones where the ball just somehow takes a ridiculously lucky hop and ends up on his, on his feet, and he converts it to a goal. So hopefully he can keep getting some of those good bounces. So there, there are some drawbacks. But he is a vast improvement to the striker core before. Uh, Kellen Acosta is a huge upgrade in the midfield as well. Speaking of that striker core and player moves, it's been announced. Casper Shabilko has been transferred to Lugano, the Chicago Fire's sister club over in Switzerland. Now, this did require the Fire's use of their one buyout this season, but totally worth it to clear that space off the books, both monetary-wise and roster-wise, uh, roster spacing-wise, senior player, right, roster spot, uh, and also to kind of open it up for some of the other strikers so that Kutsias can get more reps, that Barlow can come in in certain game situations. Maybe you get Bezerra or a CFT player to come up for a couple games and and throw some minutes in there and get some developmental time, uh, late in games even. But yes, this is now Hugo Kuypers as the striker, and I would expect to see Yorgos Kutsias as the number two striker, possibly switching off some time with Tom Barlow, depending on how Frank Lopas wants to start it. I could see him having Barlow as the number two option just because uh, he values the experience, but we'll see. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the player moves here. Another move over to Lugano. Justin Reynolds is making the trip to Switzerland after being loaned to Lugano, which is a great move. For a young player like Justin Reynolds, is not going to be getting those first team minutes, especially with the acquisitions of the other defenders on the squad. 
but he can now go get some minutes at a high, high level playing in Switzerland and really start to develop. And also, he's going to get a lot of exposure to the rest of the Swiss League, potentially, uh, can we say UEFA Conference League? Maybe? Is that is that too far out there for, for Lugano? I haven't seen all the, how they make their all qualifications in those continental tournaments. But he's going to get exposure in Europe. And if he can stand out and be a serviceable player for Lugano on a regular basis, there may be interest in him so the fire could possibly make a nice transfer fee off of that. Or, again, you take that experience and bring it back and hopefully he can be a starter for you in two seasons or so. Last move, not a move, but a move towards a move. Arnaud Souquet, uh, the right back for the Chicago Fire, still part of the roster. And as Alex Calabrese of Men in Red Media reported, the Chicago Fire need to move one more uh, senior player off of the team in order to be roster compliant. And it's likely going to be Arnaud Souquet, especially now that he has his green card. So he does not take up an international roster spot, and we know how valuable those are to MLS teams. Some even trade them for general allocation money because they need, they, they want those extra players. Or they need to get roster compliant, depending on your situation. So with Arnaud Suke now, with his green card, taking up a domestic roster spot, he does he is much more palatable to teams around Major League Soccer. There's only... By the time you're listening to this, there might be only part of a day left or the window may have already closed for him to move around in certain areas and, and to be acquired by Major League Soccer teams. Also, he could be waived by the Chicago Fire and then get on a waiver list and possibly picked up by another club on waivers. That's a risky move because you don't want to then rely on that and have him not get picked up and then you're stuck with him and you're out of roster compliance but it is an option and i'm sure the front office of the chicago fire has been in conversations with other clubs who are like yeah we'll pick him up on waivers if you're going to do that we don't want to deal we don't want to make a deal send money trade players anything like that but yeah you put them on waivers we'll take them for sure so those are the player moves that have been happening. Those are the things that the Chicago Fire are doing to get into roster compliance. We all know how important roster compliance is. Just ask Inter Miami right now, who is essentially just having a bargain sale of a lot of their players. Now, speaking of Inter Miami and the Chicago Fire, where are they picked? The pundits over at MLSsoccer.com have picked Miami to finish anywhere between first and fifth after this crazy preseason that they have and the chicago fire though have been picked anywhere from seventh to 14th in the eastern conference and their average is 11th their average position was 11th so that's that's where mlssoccer.com ranked them in this preseason pickup i think that's low i had the fire and i said it on the designated players podcast i have the fire finishing seventh um, so this is a little bulletin board material that the men in red, the returned to red men in red, can take with them going into uh, the first weekend of the season. Now, the only one to pick it was Marcelo Balboa. And I was like, yes, Marcelo, I always loved you. This is great. And then I went and looked at a couple of his other picks, and he's got Miami finishing first in these. So I'm like, okay, I don't know how much I can take uh, take Marcelo Balboa's position now uh with full confidence. But anyway, the way I look at it, the Fire have improved their roster in ways that cost them points last year. They got rid of uh, Miguel Navarro. They, they've they got a better striker. You know, you don't have Shabilko missing sitters or, or tripping over his own feet anymore. Uh, you get Chris Mueller back, so you've got better position play out on the wing. You've got Andrew Goodman, who can actually provide better service into the box than Miguel Navarro, as well as better one-on-one -on -one defending. Another season with Jonathan Dean, so he has gotten a full year of MLS under his belt. And then you've got Aragoni and Salquist coming in to help bolster the back line, which was an issue last season. I, I called it out in a lot of my games. When you saw the fire having to defend fast breaks, they were backpedaling almost to their own penalty spot, allowing other players to tee off from 12, 13, 15 yards out. They just kept backpedaling. So hopefully with Salquist and Aragoni, uh, they will be able to work much better backline communications with Chihos and Tehran when he comes back or Olmsberg when he gets his chance to come in. Also, I was told, and thank you to the Reddit community, Chicago Fire Reddit community, I was told that the pundits' picks were based on chance creation. 
Now, fine. The Fire didn't really create many chances last season. They really didn't have that go-to striker. They really didn't have guys serving the ball in, unless you count Miguel Navarro and Gaston Jimenez just lobbing stuff when they could. Maybe an errant uh, Carlos Turan long ball found its way to a player every now and then. But I really think that with Kuypers being that target, with Acosta being able to hold the possession, as well as providing some good service on set pieces and corner kicks, they're going to get Mueller back. So just adding Acosta and Mueller and a reliable target like Kuypers, you're going to see those chances increase. And you're still going to get Shakiri and Gutierrez playing those balls in. Uh, long ball, short balls, mid-range balls, everything, you're going to see them. So I really think that the fire, if that was the metric that was in fact used, then I think the fire are underrated in that. But again, it was based off of last season, so we'll see. Also, the Chicago Fire's preseason, not that bad. Now again, it's the preseason. I'm never one to take the preseason as gospel, especially because there's so much player rotation. You're not playing your starters the whole time. You're not playing against starters. You're trying to make sure you just get fit and kind of work out some of the kinks in communications uh, and positioning tactics, things of that nature. But hey, here's the Fires preseason. 5-1 victory against Loudoun United. 2-2 draw against Red Bulls. 1-0 victory against Austin FC. A 3-1 loss against LAFC, which really exposed the Chicago Fires defense on that one. A 4-0 victory against Minnesota, which might be a product of just how bad Minnesota looked as much as how well the fire played. And a 2-1 victory against Portland. So, four wins, a draw, and a loss. And let's see, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15 goals scored in the preseason. <coughs> Not bad. And it wasn't like it was one player scoring every time. It wasn't Shakiri scoring from the spot three times. It wasn't say Haile Selassie cutting in from the wing three and four times. A number of different players scored, including some of the draft picks that they, they picked up this uh, this super draft. So the fire were spreading it out. They looked like a very competent team, a team ready to take the next step, especially with these additions. And I will say, I think the weakest link now is the coaching staff. We'll see if Frank Klopas and his patchwork group of coaches can actually get it done this season and bring it all together. And with that, time for the halftime break. Time for a water break, everybody. I've been talking straight for like 22 minutes here, and I'm just feeling parched. I wish I had a bottle of Skira Icelandic spring water close by because Skira is Icelandic for clear, and the water comes from a spring in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland with naturally low mineral content. This isn't your average water, clearly pun intended, it's one of the best. Go ahead and find a bottle or three of Skira Icelandic Spring Water at your local 7-Eleven. Bring it out to the game. If Come find me. I'm a season ticket holder now. I'm up in section 205. Come find me at the parking lot, at the tailgate. DM me on, on Twitter or email me at glasshousesoccer at gmail.com. We'll take a, a picture with your bottle of Skira Water and we'll send it back to the company and let them know that they've got support at Soldier Field. Now for the second half of the show, we're going to mix up the format a little bit here. We've got to talk U.S. Open Cup drama. We've got to talk pro referee drama. So in order to do this, let's take a look at the ESPN article that just came out earlier this evening, the 19th, by Jeff Carlisle about the U.S. Open Cup. So Jeff Carlisle writes, Preliminary plans for the 2024 edition of the U.S. Open Cup have been approved by a subcommittee of the U.S. Soccer Federation Board of Directors, though the tournament likely won't look like recent editions, a source close to the USSF told ESPN. The source indicated that complete details are still being ironed out, but the decision to have a tournament in 2024 has been made, and what will likely gain final approval is a hybrid type of tournament, with not every MLS team participating. The precise level of team participation from MLS and USL clubs is still to be determined. So, as we all recall, uh, MLS wanted to send their MLS Next Pro teams to the U.S. Open Cup, uh, and, and MLS had said, "We this is what we're doing. And then USSF, the U.S. Soccer Federation, who oversees the U.S. Open Cup, said, um, no, you're not. Y you can't just tell us that you're doing that. It goes against Tier 1 sanctioning, where you have to participate in your domestic cup. 
Uh, and again, we're running the tournament. You don't just get to tell us. Then MLS backtracked and said, well, we had requested it and the request was denied. And so now we're going to negotiate, try and figure it all out. And, and the tournament was in jeopardy. And as you all know, it, it all comes down to money. We'll get into that in a little bit. But that's a little bit of the backstory. But what is interesting here in these opening paragraphs in Jeff Carlisle's uh article here is it says the precise level of team participation from MLS and USL clubs is still to be determined. So this isn't just the MLS is trying to kill US Open Cup and destroy US Soccer Federation. USL clubs also have some similar grievances that, that MLS has as well. So that's something to keep in the back of your head. Uh, as well. It, it's not as widely publicized, and I'm only reading into that based on what it's saying in the article. I haven't seen uh, any statements from USL as a league or any of their clubs, but that's certainly what's being suggested here. Let's read on and, and get a little more insight. The source added that the plan calls for the Federation to make its largest financial investment ever to ease the cost of travel and assist with promotion, especially for lower division teams. Well, there you go. So it seems like the lower divisions are speaking up. The source also indicated this format would be for 2024 only, and there are ongoing discussions with all stakeholders about working collaboratively to find a permanent long-term format for the tournament. And as a, as, as a guy who has had several management positions, who's worked for a couple big companies, that's the greatest corporate speak you'll ever hear. Here we go. Let's identify the corporate buzzwords. Uh... Ongoing discussions, bing, with all stakeholders, bing, about working collaboratively, bing, to find permanent long-term solutions, bing, <laughs> like this is just, it's just corporate speak right there, that's all that was, it means nothing. Okay, continuing on. The future of the tournament, the first edition of which was completed in 1914, and but for COVID, I'm, this is me adding it now, but for COVID was the longest running professional sports tournament in the United States, and I think the third lar third longest running uh, soccer tournament in the world. Yeah, 100 years until COVID. Almost 100 years until COVID, yeah. Um, the future of the tournament has been in doubt since MLS announced in December that its first teams wouldn't participate in the competition and that teams from MLS Next Pro would take their place. In an interview with ESPN late last week, and go find this article, it's it's a good one. There's some good quotes from the commission here. MLS Commissioner Don Garber said about the Open Cup, quote, Everybody in the soccer business needs to rethink how competitions have been organized to ensure that we can continue to evolve and manage what is the single biggest issue for all professional soccer, and that's the management of our schedule, end quote. Now, he's not wrong that scheduling and schedule congestion is definitely one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issue, in pro sport, pro soccer all over the world. But let's read on. While the MLS schedule has become more crowded in recent years, some of that is the league's own doing with its creation of League's Cup in collaboration with Liga MX. MLS's announcement of non-participation appeared to be at odds with USSF's professional league standards designed to set minimum standards for items like minimum finances of owners, stadium capacity, and market size. The league standards state that teams from a top-flight outdoor league Quote, must participate in all representative U.S. soccer and CONCACAF competitions for which they are eligible, end quote. And this is where a lot of people are really saying that U.S. soccer has to call MLS's bluff. They have to say, you will lose your Tier 1 sanctioning unless you participate fully per the rules that we all agreed to. Now, MLS is taking the kind of the business negotiation approach, saying, sure, that was the agreement back when we started in 1994 when we founded the league and started play in 96 it's 2024 now things change we need to change we're going to renegotiate i always hated that as a lawyer by the way when i would win a case and i would say okay your client owes ten thousand dollars and they're like sure you won the case and got your judgment for 10 grand but really how much effort do you want to put in to to collect the 10 grand i'll give you 7 i was like you yeah it just drove me nuts i hated when i heard stuff like that but that's kind of what mls is doing here right they're they're, they're trying to renegotiate they're waiting for ussf to call their bluff and we'll see if ussf does all right the article continues the usl declined to comment on the most recent news <laughs> Smart, let MLS take the heat. Uh, but back on December 20th, it responded by stating via X, formerly known as Twitter, that, 
quote, United Soccer League clubs have competed in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup for nearly 30 years, including 46 USL clubs in the 2023 edition. We believe the Open Cup is a historic and integral part of America's soccer culture. We stand with fans across the country who want to see it remain an authentic and inclusive competition. Regarding the future of the Open Cup, we will continue working with our owners and U.S. soccer on what the tournament will look like going forward, end quote. So... It's like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. It's like saying everything the fans want to hear, but at the same time recognizing all the shortcomings, especially for these USL clubs who don't have huge travel or promotion budgets, like they mentioned at the beginning of the article. Continuing on, five days after MLS's statement, the USF announced Major League Soccer has requested to allow MLS Next Pro teams to represent them in the 2024 Lamar Hunt US Open Cup. We have informed MLS that U.S. Soccer staff recommendation, which was adopted by the Pro League Task Force, is that the request is denied. All right, let's see what Don Garber now is quoted in this article. What has happened over time is that the tournament has not resonated enough with fans and commercial partners and sponsors, and certainly media partners, in a way to justify the level of participation that had been required of us in the past. And over time, MLS has come into the tournament at different levels. We've had different numbers of teams, all ways that the league and the Federation and the U.S. Open Committee have worked to try to ensure that the tournament is working for everybody. Okay, here's where I actually, don't hate me for it, here's where I kind of actually agree with Don Garber when he says there's not enough commercial partners and sponsors or broadcasting. I mean, how hard was it to go find streams of these games and, and whatever random websites there were, right? Either the rights weren't there or these lower division teams couldn't have the capabilities of just getting someone with like a, a phone on a tripod to just stream it to their Facebook page or something. Whatever the deal was, the, the games were not being broadcasted in an easy to find and follow format. And you, everyone said the prize money's not there. And that's, I saw a great meme today where it was like, people argue that the MLS monopoly is all about the money. And then on the, and then on the other side of the mouth, they're going to say, well, the MLS needs to put up more money <laughs> for, for this tournament, right? Or USSF is in bed with MLS and they just want the money and then they need to put up more money. So you you kind of see the dichotomy of arguments here, right? And yeah, the prize money, not really worth it for a lot of MLS teams, to be perfectly honest. Forget what it was if it was just over a million bucks. What's that going to get you uh, in MLS standards today, right? Yeah, that'd be amazing for a USL club to get, but... As we all know, the USL clubs have not won the tournament, but once or twice in the last, but once in the last 20 some years, I forget, I'm forgetting my own history right now. Um, but yeah, the prize money just hadn't been there for MLS clubs. Um, let's take a look and see what else is going on in this article. That's, oh, here's, here's the other interesting take on it as well. Um, the the head of what is his title arthur matson who resigned his position as committee chair uh over the u.s open cup over all of this so he had been told by ussf to stand down so maybe he was taking that hard line approach and ussf told him don't do it stand down stop picking a fight with major league soccer and possibly usl and other leagues and so he just resigned um very interesting moment and the other speculation here too, purely speculation, purely rumor, purely nightmare, is that you're going to see Nelson Rodriguez get involved more and more uh, with MLS and U.S. Open Cup and just ruin that like you ruined the Chicago Fire. I don't want to end on a negative note, but hey, when, when the leagues and, and the federation are arguing, it's not really positive, right? So that's the latest from the article. What I would personally love to see... You know, I'm kind of a status quo guy. Like, keep the status quo, right? If Just let the tournament run, but we know that's not going to work for MLS and probably not going to work for USL. Uh, there, there definitely has to be a compromise there. That's 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 the lawyer in me, right? That's the, that's the insurance lawyer in me especially. Like, there's a compromise here. We can find uh, a middle ground. We can settle on this somehow. And with MLS finding more money and opportunity in, in the League's Cup, as well as playing an additional, uh, you know, an expanded CONCACAF Champions Cup tournament as well, there's got to be some sort of compromise out there where we can still have a quality U.S. Open Cup tournament. Or you make it an amateur tournament. Just say the U.S. Open Cup amateur tournament 
and then you run it with those clubs, and then you have a concurrent U.S. Open Cup Pro Tournament, and you do it with USL, MLS, uh, NISL, you know, a couple other leagues there. And, and you just kind of run that and see maybe you run two concurrent tournaments with varying entries and prizes. I, I don't know. There's no easy solution, but there is a solution there. I just don't think we have heard it yet because both sides are digging in. Now, we've got one more big news item to, to discuss. The lockout of referees for Major League Soccer as well as USL and WSL um, because the professional referees organization is locking out uh, the referees who provide services to all those leagues here. Um, they failed to reach a new collective bargaining agreement ahead of the season, uh, but we're going to focus on MLS here because that's what this podcast is. Now, I, I think technically this is different than a strike since pro is locking them out and won't let them come to work versus the referees not actually going to work. But for the everyday fan, it's about the same. We'll have replacement refs to start the season. Uh, and, and in effect, the lockout could have already started. It could have started uh, on the 18th, 12.01, right? Now, people have had mixed reactions to this. Some jokingly say, oh, how can the refereeing get any worse? which my response to that is the last time there was a, uh, a work stoppage for the referees, a handful of the replacement refs actually became pro-certified referees and had continued on and had decent referee careers. So, you, hey, there's talent out there, right? Cast a wide net. Uh, some other people say, hey, you got to stand with labor. you got to stand with the labor unions. Now, to, to those people, I just have a general question. Like, do you consider this like similar to, say, the auto workers who went, who, who went on strike earlier or, or like a teacher's union, the referee's union? Do you hold them? at the same level is, is labor labor or do you kind of maybe relax your standards because it is labor but it's, it's in an entertainment industry like professional sports i just wonder what your thoughts are on that i'm genuinely curious uh to see if anyone has as you know a, a take on that again dm me glasshouse soccer on twitter or email me uh glasshouse soccer at gmail.com couple things we do need to remember, though, that the pro referees, at least in the theory, jokes aside, right, the pro referees had the best training. They know the nuances of all the laws, not just the laws, the big ones, the letter of the law, all the nuances, all the little exceptions, everything like that. They've got the ability to manage a game and the emotions that come with it. They've worked in teams. Uh, they know each other's tendencies. They, they work between second officials, sideline officials, fourth officials, VAR. They have all of this down. It's a real set process, right? So... Replacement referees, stand-in referees, whatever you want to call them, scabs if you want to call them that, um, they may not have the experience to to handle all of that, including player safety issues. They might not realize when a player gets a potential head injury or when there are some bad tackles coming in or things keeping an eye off the ball, right? A lot of the times players, just like referees, their eyes are following the play of the ball. They may not be watching like a, like a professionally trained referee what's going on around the pitch or they might not, if you're, especially if you're an assistant referee on the sideline and you're watching the ball instead of what's going on. So these are all the potential issues that could arise, and I'm sure there's many others. But none worse than the fact that the first few weeks of the MLS regular season, the games that count, will be the preseason for these stand-in referees. Let's hope it doesn't come at the cost of a, of a result for a team or points, but I can't see at least one. I can see at least one time this is going to come into a play and cost the team a goal or a point or a victory or something or a yellow card versus a red card and a suspension or something that's going to come to life later on in the season. Accumulation, suspensions, whatever it is. Disciplinary actions. I just can't see a clean first few weeks with replacement referees. I just can't see it. It's just the odds, right? Now, Jeff Carlisle He's been busy. He put out another article on ESPN.com and really kind of laid out a, a, a neutral standpoint. And essentially, uh, pros general manager Mark Geiger said, we made meaningful progress during recent bargaining, agreeing to fair pay increases, and addressing many of PSRAs, uh, which is the, the name of the Professional Soccer Referees Association, their union that represents MLS, NWSL, and USL. There it is. Um, and he said, we met, their con we met many of their concerns with respect to non-economic items, uh, saying, but apparently it wasn't enough. In fact, 
98% of the union membership voted and 95.8% voted to reject it. So that's huge. 96%? First of all, 98% turnout in most voting, and I'm thinking elections here is insane. Maybe union votes aren't really that high. Uh, but 96% rejection? That's wild. That's such that like I haven't seen a 96% on anything since I was like in second grade math. Let's be honest. That is wild. So um, that is kind of the, the neutral take is it's just like any other collective bargaining agreement. Um, neither side can come to an agreement on things, right? Pro offered this, PSRA wanted more, or they wanted uh, focus on other things. Where where I do kind of. Uh, think from pro's perspective that if you have an expense say of x amount of dollars on something it's for your referees for their salary for their travel for their um insurance benefits whatever else you're spending right you can't go from spending x to spending 10x it's just, it's not feasible for a business, for a company, for an organization to have a 10 time output the very next year, right? And you, and you have certain projections, you have potential discussions going into these bargains, whatever it is. So you say, okay, we can't go from X to 10X, but we can go from X to, to 5X. So you're not going to get everything you want referee association so we're, we're going to focus on salary right you say salary is a big concern so we're going to focus we're going to make you the highest paid referees in the world okay you still got to fly coach you still don't have the best benefits you still don't have the best retirement plan you know where's the where's the trade-off there right that's kind of what i'm thinking this comes down to is that pro can't commit to all of that all at once and it's got to be incremental we saw that with uh, the MLS Players Association in their last round of bargaining that they wanted everything. And of course, that's how you're going to start when at the beginning of a bargain, you want everything, you even add more stuff in there that you can use as bargaining chips to, to eliminate and say you're making concessions. You want everything. And, and, and then you kind of whittle it back down to really what's the most important thing to you. But in that negotiation with the players, you saw them work like an incremental scale out of salary increases, travel increases, money spent on travel and incidentals and all the other stuff like that. So maybe they could take a page out of the player's book and do some sort of step increase for all of these things and come to, to an agreement. But now speaking of pro, here is their statement from their website. And I think this kind of lays out things in a little more number, number perspective here. The professional referee organization has been negotiating with the Professional Soccer Referees Association since October 2023, but has yet to conclude a new collective bargaining agreement. A tentative agreement was reached last weekend. However, PSRA members who officiate regularly in MLS voted this week to reject the deal. Uh, so to me, that kind of seems like PSA, PSRA, like th their board members were a little out of touch with the membership, how you can negotiate a deal, present it to your membership, and then be rejected by 96% of it. Just maybe some internal strife there too. Um, PSRA also rejected a proposal from PRO for the parties to mutually agree not to institute a strike or lockout uh, through 2024. Consequently, PRO will lock out its match officials effective 12 a.m. Eastern time, February 18th. By the time you hear this, that would already have happened. The proposed new five-year CBA would have provided significantly improved pay and benefits for all officials, particularly assistant referees and video match officials. The key terms included, before I read the terms, that's what I was saying, right? You, you can't go from X to 10X. And so you're going to hear how the increase for referees was this much, but the increase for assistant referees and other officials was a lot more. So maybe that miffed a couple of head referees and maybe that miffed some ARs who are ready to become head referees. So here, here are the points. Overall increases in guaranteed pay for the agreement's first year, 10 to 33% for referees, 75 to 104% for assistant referees, and 15 to 100% for video match officials plus increased match fees for regular season games and playoffs. So yeah, they're really compensating uh, the secondary officials here. Next point, uh, there was an increase of 7% in 2027 for all salaries and retainers and match fees, the highest mid-contract raise ever offered. 
with 3% increase in all other years. So again, they're really trying to just dump it into salaries here. Also, first or business class air travel for playoffs and MLS Cup throughout the deal and for decision day in 2027 and 2028. And additional benefits included enhanced injury continuance for referees and assistant referees, physical therapy reimbursement for referees and assistant referees, in-pro sports performance program, employer contributions for assistant referees and video match officials for reimbursable healthcare costs, and increased severance for referees and assistant referees. So it looks like they're giving up a lot, but from the membership of PSRA, wasn't enough, and here we are in a lockout. Um, so that that's what I will say. I also will end on this statement from Major League Soccer because I think I'm, I've done two shows in one here tonight. Um, Major League Soccer put out this statement, which many people have said is misleading. And I'll, I'll read it and then we'll, we'll wrap here. Earlier this week, representatives of Professional Referee Organization and Professional Referee Association reached a landmark collective bargaining agreement that included the largest compensation increase in pro referee CBA history, representing a 25% overall increase over 2023 when comparing salaries, game fees, benefits, plus the addition of business class travel for certain matches. The agreement would have made pro members among the highest paid soccer match officials in the world. Despite having an agreement with the leadership, PSRA's membership, which consists of match officials, voted down the CBA. Pros inform MLS it's locking out its match officials as of 12.01 a.m. on February 18th. So what people say is misleading here is that it focuses on salary when what uh, the, the membership wanted was a lot more things, like the travel. So that's something to keep in mind. And it's it's interesting because in the management courses I've taken recently and the HR courses that I've taken over the course of my career talking about employee retention, salary isn't everything anymore. You see a shift in the workforce saying, I will be fine with a little bit of a less salary so long as I'm getting the extra benefits. If I get a little bit more of an employer match, if I get to work from home, if I get uh, a company car to use instead of having to do that, put those miles on my own car and get reimbursed at a terrible rate. So there has been a shift in the thinking of employees and maybe professional referees aren't any different that they're okay with a little less salary if they get to fly first class for whatever assignments they get, which you know what? If you, the, as big as this country is and all the matches you got to get to, uh, I, I, it makes sense at a certain level for me. So I, I will leave you with all of that. We're not even going to jump onto the transfer tracker and see the latest moves because, man, we have been here way too long. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Again, go find all the, the content that I put out on the Return to Red kit launch on Facebook, uh, Glass House Soccer page, YouTube, Glass House Soccer, on Instagram, Glass House Soccer, on Twitter, at Glass House Soccer. We're, we're, we're trying to build the channel a little bit more, and with your continued support, it's going to happen. Remember, like, share, subscribe, rate, review. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your enemies. You know, you, you got spring break coming up, season openers coming up. Let's, let's generate some buzz around Feed the fire, glass house soccer, and you know what? Most of all, let's let's grow the conversation on the sport here in the United States. And with that, I will say thank you again, and let's go fire.